this PowerPoint is designed to discuss what neuroscientists are discovering about memories, how they're stored, as well as how they're processed. While we have a lot to learn about memory, scientists are in agreement that there are two types, working memory and long-term memory. Working memory has to do with um, taking incoming information and being able to manipulate it. Although it is limited in storage space and time that we can work with information, it is one way that we process incoming data. And then long-term memory involves both declared and declarative and non-declarative. Declarative memories that are long-term require conscious processing in order to bring them back to the forefront. Non-declarative memories do not require conscious processing. What we know about the way memories are formed is that it involves connections between nerve cells. And as the nerves fire together, they end up wiring together over time. So the more times um, a memory is acted upon, the more likely those nerve cells are going to fire together and wire together. And the more networks we use to activate a memory, the more likely it will be able to be recalled. In order to store a memory, we have to first encode it, and then it gets stores in multiple places in the brain, and then we retrieve it when we have future use for that information. What's unknown by most people is that when we encode information into our memory, we literally deconstruct the memory. And parts of the memory that deal with visual cues might go to one spot, parts of the memory that deal with sound may go to another and we literally have to reconstruct a memory in order to retrieve it. Short-term memory is stored in the prefrontal cortex, and what occurs when we're processing short-term memory is that we need eight seconds of uninterrupted time in order to get information into short-term memory. And we have a limited amount of information we can sort through at any one time, seven pieces of information to be exact, and although we can increase that amount by chunking information together, it still is limited in both time and amount of information we can work with. Long-term memories, particularly declarative memories, are um, processed by a part of the brain known as the hippocampus. That is also the same part of the brain that is used to help retrieve those types of memories. Procedural memory which are the memories of movements, um, coordination, occur in the cerebellum. Emotional memories are stored in an area known as the amygdala, which is part of the limbic system. There are several factors that affect whether or not a student will retain information. Primacy recency effect deals with the fact that we'll remember things we learned first and last in a sequence. The length of the teaching episode makes a difference. 20 minutes is a good length of time to learn um, the content. Anything longer than that and we have downtime. Methods of teaching matters. The more active the teaching method, the better. Practice and rehearsal over time. Uh, the more distributed the practice, the better. Mass practice is not as effective for long-term memory. There are two ways that we can rehearse information. There's rote rehearsal and elaborative. Rote rehearsal is where we memorize something exactly as we learned it, like the times tables or the alphabet. And elaborative rehearsal involves um, more uh, of us using the information in multiple contexts. The more contexts we use the information in, the more likely we'll be able to retrieve that information later. Elaborative rehearsal strategies involve strategies that engage multiple modes of learning, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. If we utilize these in our teaching, chances are our students will retain what it is that we've taught them. Paraphrasing, note-taking, predicting, questioning, and summarizing are all some strategies that fit the category of elaborative rehearsal. Edgar Dale created what he calls the cone of learning to get at the kinds of activities that 
involve the learner and then lead to greater retention. In the pyramid that you see on this page, the items at the top of the pyramid get at less levels of involvement, therefore less retention, and the items at the bottom require more um, involvement by the learner and therefore more retention. Once we um, retain information, we are going to need to retrieve it at a later time in order to utilize that information. So the encoding of information actually happens in the left hemisphere of the brain, whereas the right hemisphere is involved in retrieving information. We can retrieve information through recognition or recall. Recognition, we're just matching the outside stimulus to information we have stored in our brain, whereas recall requires us to um, search long-term memory, retrieve and consolidate that information and decode it back into working memory so we can use it. It's much more difficult to recall information than it is to recognize information, but that's what the process that we need in order for students to use information uh, in the, a future learning situation. There are a variety of factors that affect the retrieval of information. The um, cues that are used in helping us retrieve information, um, if they're adequate enough, they will help us find that information. The mood of the retriever matters. Um, if we're in a sad mood, we'll tend to retrieve sad memories. If we're in a positive mood, more positive memories. The context of the retrieval makes a difference. Um, if we learn the information in one context and retrieve it in a similar context, we're more likely to remember it. And then the system of storage makes a difference. Um, some people are better able to retrieve information because they can make more connections with prior knowledge and therefore can access that information easily. Other folks need additional wait time in order to process information because it's not as easy to retrieve for them um, due to lack of prior experiences to connect the information to. Our ultimate goal in education is transfer of learning from one context to another. Um, we do as teachers have to concern ourselves with whether students can make the transfer from what they've learned in prior experiences to the new learning. And then we also want to concern ourselves with can they apply what they've learned in a, a different context outside of the classroom, which is transfer of learning. Factors that affect transfer are very similar to those that affect retrieval. The context in which we learn the original material um, and the context in which we're trying to transfer that material makes a difference. If it's similar, that's better. Um, the way that we took in the information initially, if it's similar to the way we're being asked to transfer the information, that's important. The critical attributes of the concept we learned initially, did we learn how it's similar and different from other concepts. If so, we'll be more likely to transfer that information. And association is related to, do we have a positive uh, emotional uh, feeling about what we learned? And did we have real world examples to associate with what we learned? If so, we'll be more likely to transfer it. There are a variety of strategies that support transfer of learning. Bridging involves connecting with students' prior experience. Hugging involves connecting learning to real life experiences outside of school. Metaphor, analogy, and simile involve manipulating information to really show your depth of understanding. Writing about what you're learning helps to solidify transfer, as does teaching things in a thematic way where um, the subjects are related 